Um, yeah, thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak about um, some of the extensions that we have been working on at Ericsson. And um, we are really thankful to the community and to the contributions, and that's why we intended to kind of upstream this uh, particular extension that we had developed based on some existing implementations that were already there. Um, so this one uh, is a mixture of uh, two different concepts. So one is um, the implementation of the uh, tapping filter, uh, the gRPC tapping sync, and the other one is um, hardware accelerator mem copy, which is done by uh, my colleague Yijuju from uh, Intel. Um, so just as a background, uh, what we do, um, so uh, we are a small group of uh, Envoy developers within Ericsson who uh, modify, extend um, Envoy uh, HTTP2 filters to fit within the use cases and requirements for a 5G core um, network function. Uh, so uh, in this particular endeavor, uh, I was assisted by my dear colleague Sven Steinacker, who couldn't be here due to some reason, and um, uh, also Yu Zhu Zhu from Intel, who couldn't be here because of some issues. Um, uh, so uh, the agenda for today, is so we would give some background on what was the uh, main use case this was uh, trying to solve, and um, why tapping particularly, and then the overview of the existing tapping syncs and why we decided to go for a new gRPC-based tapping sync. And then some additional customizations that we added on top as well um, to get some uh, statistics and uh, address frame ca uh, caching and replay um, mechanism uh, introduced within that tapping uh, filter. And then lastly, uh, it would be uh, regarding the hardware acceleration for mem copies um, uh, that was done by my colleague Yishu. Um, so starting with, uh, just to give some background on why we kind of launched into this whole endeavor. Uh, so this is how the 5G core network roughly looks like. And it is basically, um, you can consider it as a service mesh uh, with all the interfaces are connected via HTTP2. And so um, um, the network functions on which uh, me and my colleagues work on are the ones marked in green, which are called uh, a service communication proxy and a security and edge protection proxy. Uh, both of them use Envoy within for s a specific routing, observability, or other traffic uh, network uh, traffic requirements that we have uh, to fulfill within uh, a 5G core network. Um, and so. Uh, let's start with the uh, question itself that we got is um, why to trace traffic? Like um, there are already some existing uh, good mechanisms to observe what is happening within a network. For example, metrics. Uh, but metrics can only show a limited information about the certain failure situation as labels cannot just go on forever. And they cannot also include complete header body or query information. And then um, this particular diagram shows um, a particular pain point that we have in our, in our network, uh, which is that we have a multi-vendor ecosystem. And so each vendor comes up with his or her own implementation of the network function. And uh, you can assume that um, the orange one is made up of one particular vendor, the blue one's from one uh, different one, the green from uh, a third vendor and the gray one from a fourth. And so let's say there was some sort of fault in the uh, orange uh, colored vendor, and it tried to send a wrong subscribe request to uh, the target upstream. Uh, so let's say you wanted to isolate somehow uh, that this orange um, node was the cause of the problem and you started looking at the metrics and you cannot figure out because metrics only show that you get a 5XX uh, from PCF, but it doesn't give you any more information than that. And another thing yeah, that you can do is raise the log levels, uh, but then another beautiful thing about 5G core networks and in live operation is that uh, you're pretty much never allowed to raise the log levels or something by the operator. 
And so there are very little means by which we can get any meaningful information by, uh, by uh, logs. And then another two methods that we could have is TCP dump or some eBPF-based tracing. TCP dump uh, on the interface could work, but that would involve elevating privileges, which is a big no-no. And um, also eBPF has the same problem of elevated privileges and other security issues. Um, so all of that makes um, the envoy that sits in this blue SCP uh, a prime candidate for observing the traffic. Uh, and um, basically going with the um, decision flow that we had to make on how the architecture should look like. So Envoy has both um, ingress and egress um, uh, custom filters, and uh, we have our own specific set of HTTP2 filters that we use for all of our, um, supporting all of our use cases. And um, one of the easiest ways to provide this HTTP2 information is by simply logging. However, if there's too many logs, then um, the, uh, uh, so this blue processing unit that you see, which is consuming the information for um, the traffic, it will need to process multiple log lines, and um, that would add additional stress to that particular process. So eventually, we then decided to start using tapping filter that were there. And um, uh, we decided to make some experiments with it, and try a few things out. And eventually, we learned a few things. Um, so uh, there are two basic uh, methods by which you can get a tap uh, with an Envoy. One is via TCP tapping, and the other one is via HTTP um, tapping. TCP tapping creates um, traffic trace representations on a TCP event. That is, on a connection open or close, or on a connection read or write. HTTP tapping, uh, on the other hand, creates a traffic trace representation on an HTTP event, uh, on which is a header data trailer encoding or decoding sequence. Uh, so these basically operate as a callback, more or less. And um, the main function of tapping is to just um, send these internal representation whenever these callbacks are invoked. Um, so uh, basically, the way I like to think about um, filter chains within Envoy is to look at them like uh, pancakes. Uh, so basically, a different type of a um, filter functionality represents a different pancake. And I like to layer them in a particular sequence. And um, say, on the ingress side, I like to layer them as TLS, and then a buffer, and then the tapping. And then I have all my custom HTTP2 filter chains that sit in the middle. Uh, and then on the egress side, we have, again, our um, tapping so uh, transport socket and the uh, buffer transport socket and TLS transport socket. Um, and, uh, and then um, let's look at uh, having more functionality within it. Uh, which is to only trace selectively on particular traffic paths. So for that, we had to extend um, some parts of the uh, tap config impl um, uh, classes within Envoy, so as to provide on the listener side um, uh, some sort of filtering based on source or uh, source IP or port. And then on the egress side, uh, we used um, existing machinery, uh, which is to use this transport socket matches filter, which has been very handy to um, selectively tap uh, just the endpoints that we need. So the way uh, Envoy works is uh, it has a representation called as an endpoint for each upstream host that you want to connect to. And each of those endpoints can be selectively matched to a type of a transport socket based on some metadata that you insert to this transport socket. So for example, you have three hosts, H1, H2, and H3, uh, that you configure in your Envoy filter with um, a certain 
uh, metadata called tab, which you set to true for H1 and H3, and for H2 you set it to false. And then you set up two transport sockets. Uh, one of them um, uh, enables a tapping filter when the uh, tap metadata is present, and the other one doesn't enable a tap filter. It just has a raw buffer socket. And so in this way, uh, on egress, you can selectively trace only the requests that go to H1 and H3 and not to H2. Um, this has been kind of critical for us because um, the networks that we work with have um, 400 to 500 upstreams and like equal number of downstreams. And all of them are processing basically your 5G core network uh, signaling requests. So they are at uh, several million requests per second um, across multiple NY nodes. So um, we don't want to overload our system with needless tracing. And so selectivity has been critical. And then finally, um, uh, the question is basically which uh, tapping sync to use. Uh, so NY already offers um, uh, uh, two tapping syncs. One is file-based, and the other one is admin-based. Um, file-based tapping syncs are unacceptable for critical use cases with um, security and privacy concerns, because they basically uh, dump every uh, information regarding the uh, request onto a file, and um, that would then put additional uh, requirements on the storage and so on and so forth. So we don't want to go into that direction. Admin sync um, is the, or seemed like the prime candidate that we could have used. However, on a closer inspection, uh, we found out that it had a um, bit of an issue. Uh, so basically, uh, what we had was a kind of a bottleneck onto the main thread. So um, NY has this basic silo threading approach, which is uh, quite fantastic when you want to extend um, custom filters. They are quite easy to write, and um, they are quite easy to understand uh, with regards to connection and request lifetimes. Um, however, the problem comes in with this tapping filter that the admin sync is basically existing on the main thread, because that's where the admin interface largely lives. And therefore, the worker threads had to send these traces back to the uh, admin um, interface. And that created a bottleneck on the main thread, which you can see in the red one. Uh, so this was uh, with an example config with static configuration. And um, you can see without tapping, the main thread is hardly activated. It is just the stats uh, syncing that was happening. And with um, admin interface tapping, we see that the um, CPU utilization just spikes uh, a lot. Uh, and um, we decided to avoid that, mainly because we have a custom control plane. And we never wanted our XDS um, uh, procedures to ever be blocked or our stats to be ever interrupted. Um, so for that, we decided to go with a new tapping interface uh, with the main objective that we don't um, interfere with the main thread as far as possible to stream the tra uh, traces. And then we decided um, to build up on the interfaces for the gRPC uh, tapping sync. Uh, we took inspiration from an earlier discussion around this topic uh, within the community, uh, within the GitHub, and um, uh, we uh, made a prototype of it, and then, um, yeah, uh, with a custom traffic sync and with uh, multiple worker threads initially, and then we kind of fine-tuned it and a lot of other stuff. Um, so basically, the um, a fundamental aspect is that um, these uh, information regarding tapping comes in two parts. One is the connection-related information, which is basically a source destination IP and port, and then a connection reference ID that is associated with it. And then there are your actual trace information, which is just base64 encoded header and body information that would be present in your HTTP2 request. 
um, and the trace information carries a reference to the connection to which it belongs. So each connection information would have a connection ID, and that connection ID would be represented within each trace frame. And then you can do post-processing on it, uh, do it live, pretty much, and um, that is the cool part. Uh, and um, get a more suitable representation, for example, PCAP or PCAP-NG, and uh, give it to a post-processing sync or analytics unit, which gives you live bulk tracing information of your entire network. Uh, so uh, one shortcoming, however, with this uh, pros with this thought uh, experiment was that, say, your um, sync had some sort of a disturbance and it had to restart. Since uh, the connection information was only sent once and later on you're just um, giving it some reference, that connection information is essentially lost by the sync on a restart. And so we decided to give a custom handshake procedure and a, a connection uh, and an address connection replay uh, machinery, which is this um, uh, additional uh, cache that we introduce within each worker thread. Uh, basically, it's just a map of a connection reference and um, a connection reference ID and the whole connection information. And it would be uh, populated basically on a connection in it and uh, basically removed from the cache on a connection close, which are given via uh, very friendly callbacks within tap config impl. And based on that, you can uh, detect a connection uh, termination or a disruption via a custom handshake sequence or via uh, attaching TCP socket properties uh, to the client that is uh, initiating that gRPC push. Um, and then you could replay the connection information to the remote sync, and that way um, your connection information is always represented uh, for all your trace information. Um, there are some additional options as well. Uh, for example, there's buffering option, and um, there is um, uh, also uh, tapping at the HTTP level. However, H um, the way silo threading basically works is um, at a particular layer, it creates um, an object. So since we are dealing with uh, traffic that are mostly low in number of connection but high in number of requests, we don't want to create too many objects by uh, spawning an HTTP uh, level tapping filter. So we instead went with this uh, connection level uh, tapping filter. Uh, and also um, live streaming uh, rather than buffering meant that we could see uh, the traffic as it was getting processed on the ingress and egress of the NY side. And um, another thing that we added was the capability to observe um, uh, the traces that we were producing and produce some st uh, statistics for it. We had a similar counterpart for our tracing uh, sync um, uh, for uh, counting similar number of trace events and stuff. And that's the way we ensure that um, on live networks we had a consistency of what we were intending to tap. And um, overall, we were quite happy with the tracing solution that we developed. Um, the overhead uh, introduced by the tapping system was roughly, was lesser than 5% in our max RPS capacity for one Envoy um, node. And end-to-end -end latency with uh, tapping enabled on multiple listeners and cluster was in the order of uh, one to two milliseconds. However, uh, this has to be taken with um, big conditions applied. It depends on uh, what is the loading condition, what is the network setup, all that. But um, we, it was quite good uh, for a telecom-based application, so it is um, uh, really working quite well. And it has been extremely stable in production networks with some of the nodes being deployed uh, since day one, um, a couple of, uh, at least three or four qu quarters back, and um, with uh, several hundred thousand to few million requests per second being traced in live IGCO networks. 
And for the hardware acceleration part, I um, would like to present um, a recorded video by my colleague uh, who would explain further details about this. Hello everyone, this is Ijo from Intel. We're glad to share this topic with that to you at Invoicon. Unfortunately, for some reason, I can't join you today in Chicago, so I got to share my part from video. Now let's let me continue our session on hardware acceleration. As you may know, for most cases, memory copy is not a problem for Envoy. Requests and response are limited to a few kilobytes in size and won't take much time in the overall process. But for some special scenarios and requirements, things are different. Like traffic mirror, a feature allows users shadowing traffic from one cluster to another. This is a very useful feature that allows feature teams to bring changes to production with as little risk as possible. And why we'll make a copy of live request data to mirror service. With the increasing request size, the data copy can be quite substantial. And another example is TLS memory linearize. This is an operation defining buffer system occurs before TLS encryption is applied. Linearized copy and recombining multiple small size buffer into a large one to reduce the frequency of encryption and associated overhead. For large size response, linearized also comes with a significant amount of copy, which can up to 10% of overall processing our test. As for traffic tapping, our topic today. Memory copy is also a crucial issue that cannot be ignored when it comes to a large request or response. Tapping filter would make a copy of all traffic to generate pro buffer fail, then save it locally or send to remote service for later analysis. This scenario performs more intensively copy compared to previous scenarios. Based on our observation, the proportion of copy can up to 20% of the entire process in some cases. So we believe it can be a scenario suitable for hardware acceleration. Now let's have a brief introduction of hardware we're using for acceleration. DSA, short for Data Streaming Accelerator, is a PCI device integrating fourth generation Xeon processor as well as the accelerator. It's already hit the market this year. DLC supports a series of memory copy operations like move the memory copy, dual-cast, copy data from one address to another two addresses at once, and so on. One thing we should know about the factors that affect memory operator acceleration is the copy size is the key value. When the copy size exceeds a certain range, like 200 kilobytes, we can expect benefit from DSA. Otherwise, using CPU is a better idea. So, there is also an issue we are taking into consideration in our acceleration test. Then, let's consider the issue of integration. DSC provides two kinds of library, allow us to offload the, at two levels. DML, a library works at application level or using DTO, short for DSA transparent offload library at the library level. The advantage of using DML is that we can precisely control every single copy. But the drawback is you need very best knowledge on how acceleration can help. As we said before, 
In many cases, it is not a good idea to upload small side copy. And another downside is the modification to the code increase complexity and maintenance costs that may out of our control. So, what we want to use is a transparent, non-intrusive approach. We we'll hope that library works at a low level, determining if each copy operation is suitable for acceleration. If the copy size is above the threshold we set, offload it. Otherwise, give it back to CPU to do it. And that is exactly how detail works. The detail is preloaded with envoy by environment variable and intercept every memory copy function to glibc. All the copies are classified into two categories based on size. Small ones to CPU, large one to DSA. In the whole process, we don't have to mess with the code and recompile it. All the offloads are transparent to Envoy. So that's the plan. Next, let's see how we perform our tests and what we got from the acceleration. We design our test using TCP tapping with HTTP 1.1 protocol. 1,000 clients connect concurrently. Fields requested by client, which is the body of the response from Envoy, ranging from 64 kilobytes to 1 megabytes in size. We also use direct response, which means the Envoy responds directly with the prepared field in the ones, instead of communicating with upstream cluster. That will significantly increase the proportion of the memory copying overall process. We have two groups, one for CPU, another using DTO with DSA. The DTO's threshold is set to 256 kilobytes, which means it will only offload for copy size above 256. And for the result, as shown in the diagram, CPU got an advantage initially. As the copy size increased, the running neck and neck at 256. Following that, DSA got a better latency than CPU, which aligns with our prediction and understanding on DSA that we got more performance benefit from bigger copy size. You might have questions about the performance difference below 256 since both are CPU-based operations. Why is such a difference observed? I think that may come from the interception overhead. Intercept and determine which way to use need to take some CPU resource. And finally, let's look at what would happen for hardware memory acceleration and what we can expect it. First, from a hardware perspective, DSA is back to a persistent feature in future generation of Zion products. So it may be faster or support more upload operations that we can introduce into Envoy for acceleration. And second, for Envoy, our software level. As a community is still exploring the potential of Envoy, many new scenarios and projects, like Envoy Gateway or something, are emerging. So it would be reason to expect there are more suitable cases, like CDN or something, for Envoy to do acceleration. So. That's all for my sharing. Thank you for your listening. Uh, thank you for the um, uh, kind listening. And um, regarding the um, st status, so we had introduced an RFC a while back to upstream this uh, tapping filter. and. Um, 
unfortunately, due to other commitments, I couldn't continue with it at that time. Uh, however, we are planning to push it, um, uh, continue working on it soon and submit the patches, um, but sometime in 2024, hopefully. And yeah, that's about it. If there are any questions or comments. Um, We're kind of up against, okay, should we take one? We're kind of up against time after that. You might have to do the rest offline. Uh, have you considered like more traditional sort of tracing? You, you, you mentioned tracing quite a lot here, but so, so, so that's why I'm asking like open telemetry tracer. There are other HTTP tracing uh, plugins in Envoy. And if you have considered like why, why couldn't you use them? Why, why did you need to go into the route of actually you know, tapping the full request? Um, yeah, so one reason, uh, because the distributed uh, tracing requirements were slightly different than what we had in mind for this. Um, this particular uh, tracing requirement was basically um, to be as uh, low overhead as possible and um, to uh, consistently give out um, uh, the representation for the HTTP request in a P PCAP or PCAP NG format. So that meant that we had to do quite a lot of uh, post-processing outside of Envoy. And so we needed to get some sort of a representation for that. And um, the um, open telemetry-based um, solutions didn't exactly fit this one. So rather what um, fits that kind of a use case is really tapping sinks. And so we had to use that. Um, cool, thank you. If there's any more questions, uh, I guess you'd probably have to catch the van after. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much. But uh, thank you, Greg, for the talk. <laughs>